All right, guys. So just getting back from SEMA, um, I've got a few things I want to cover. Sorry about the horrible lighting. Um, but what I'll do real quick is we're to go over um, rotary engine porting, how much is too much, who to listen to when it comes to this sort of thing, uh, a power breakdown, and really how I feel a lot of these shops are upselling for extra profit and really what might suit you best. So the most common entry level is somewhere around 350 horsepower. Um, at that point, you really you need to focus on optimizing your engine flow versus your turbo. And this, this goes for any stage, any level of this. Um, at 350 horsepower and below, stock port is the way to go. Like, you get an 800 RPM idle or lower, and the drivability is all there. Now, there are massive improvements if you do, let's say, a stock port to a medium street port. Um, you can shift that power band a good five to 600 RPM up. You elongate the width of the power band. Um, it does work very effectively um, when done properly. And I'll be very clear about this for the millionth time, but I know very few engine builders that impress me with their work. And you'll see shops where their stage five is a large street port. You'll see other shops where they have a semi-peripheral port as a suggested port for something that's like sub 400 horsepower, sub 500 horsepower. And a peripheral port is always going to make less torque. So you have to ask yourself why, right? If I can do well over 600 horsepower to the wheels on a non-studded full bridge, then why? Most of you are not going to be chasing anything near that power plant level. So we can overbuild to a certain extent. We can do half inch studs. We can do through bolts. We can do all sorts of doweling type stuff, but you really have to understand what is the point of doing that if my goals are only 400 horsepower, 500 horsepower, 350 like I was saying to start off with? There is a lot of extra, right? And instead of putting money and time into that part of it, you're better off going for something that eliminates problems like a crank angle sensor, that is with the Hall effect sensor, which now I have a buddy who's doing this for us and it's his design. He also has a full sync trigger wheel that he's doing as well. This is a better use of your time and efforts than going with some huge overly built motor. Um, these engine builders, some of them I've seen one particular locally who takes a perfect 110, 115 compression motor, rebuilds it, doing his style porting, and we're talking a street port that now has 90 PSI on all faces at best. Obviously the guy doesn't know what he's doing, um, but that is a common or commonality practice what we're seeing. And so what I'm trying to get you guys to think of is this whole staging system and, and how certain things are going together really needs to be suited for your turbo sizing, which is going to be suited for the needs of the vehicle. Now, if you live in the mountains like I do, you're going to have tight, technical, undulating corners. You're going to have responses of priority. And with certain setups, a semi peripheral port, for instance, if you're running a standard 30 millimeter, 32 millimeter, these huge fucking honking semi P's, there is no engine response without very, very well figured out 
the rest of the parts of the engine. That might be fun for some of you. Roll racing could benefit from that. But there are reasons not to do that. Um, I don't like a dull, large air gulp that I have to chase with fuel. That's why all my drive-by-wire strategies are very particular in that regard. Um, that's why I'm getting more engine response from limiting drive-by-wire for certain extents. And I have advanced strategies with different ECUs to make all of this happen to where you don't feel it as a driver, but it feels the most natural, crisp drivability as you can imagine. And so when we talk about engine ports, the larger you go for an engine port, the less responsive that's going to be. These engines are velocity driven, right? If we take our energies and we focus on velocity of the air channel going into the engine, that's where we're going to have our torque. That's where we're going to have our huge benefits of drivability. And it might come on like a small displacement V8. It really does. Um, so really pay attention to when someone is upselling, you should go with this half bridge. You should go with this full bridge. You should go with this semi P. You should go with the full peripheral port, whatever it is. If you don't understand why those are offsetting and why they are certain things more beneficial in different situations, it's important to take a step back, reevaluate the build and, and the intent for the build. So the, my first question for all my clients is, where are you driving? How do you drive? If I see you cruising around the highway, 2000 RPM in fifth gear, sorry, Josh, <laughs> I'm going to suggest to you, like, we need to go with the smaller turbo. We need to go with a smaller port. We're going to go with these certain things that make your life better and more enjoyable. The car is going to be more enjoyable when it's not a laggy piece of shit, period. I can tune around and I can improve a lot of these things, but the bottom line, it comes down to your engine builder and your tuner on the same page when it comes to component selection and optimizing the car for your needs. That's very important. So when, bottom line is when do we decide to go from a stock port to a street port to a bridge port, whatever, semi P. Now, I say them in that order because that's the way that you should see them as a power goal and expectation. Personally, I have seen the larger semi P's not come to life until 24 plus PSI because that air channel of the 30 millimeter, 32 millimeter channel is so large and dull. Imagine a, a sword blade that's like a hammer instead of a sharp focused point. It is such a dull point that the CFM does not overcome the losses of the detriment of velocity until a much higher boost level. Where in respect, if you have a very nicely honed street port or a mid-sized bridge port or even a full bridge port, that's going to light off earlier. Bridge ports make significantly more torque everywhere because of the way they're designed. You're pumping in a secondary, uh, I don't want to say progressive. You're, it's a, a secondary waveform that is syncing up and making a, uh, a non-destructive wave pattern into the channel of the engine. So it's like an old, uh, let's see, Porsche intake manifold that you can have staged and that's exactly what they did is now you have essentially an intake plenum that is working in an on off mode very much like what I did for intake manifold but we're doing this with the bridge port um, on a 
hard mechanical style where it's always on. But its effective range is when the uh, channels of air sync together and create a constructive wave pattern. That's why you're going to make way more torque in a bridge port from effectively 3,500 RPM to about mm, 8,000 RPM. That's a little bit on the very ends of the spectrum, but I've seen it done. Um, and this is over the gains of a street port. And if you compare any single street port to a semi-peripheral port, the semi-peripheral port doesn't even wake up to about 6,000 RPM on average. Does it make more than the bridge? I haven't seen one. No, not one. And uh, one second for lighting. The semi-P, once it gets to a certain point, we're talking way up. We're talking 24 plus PSI. So anyone who's not running pump gas, you'll see effective rates where semi-P will start taking off. The balance of engine durability torque output and responsiveness usefulness of the setup really needs to be dwindled down to where you drive the car um, the semi-peripheral port when downsized is fantastic we're now going back to what i'm saying about a very large dull knife blade now being honed into a smaller one that's where you're going to see the benefits of the semi-p you're going to see the cooling effect at the center of the apex seal. Um, by the way, for, for those of you who don't know this, when you do a bridge port correctly, I'm going to read the very specific quote here, which is brilliant. There is a common misconception, one second, that a seal is less supported or more exposed with a full bridge. The centerpiece is held in place by the spring tension pushing outwards towards the iron, and the 45 degree wedge converts the spring pressure into a lateral force that does not allow the seal to move vertically toward the housing. People who have seal clipping just don't know how to port and build. Full bridge is always the best for most power. Half bridge is just half ass. Now, I can't fully support the idea that I, I personally love the idea of a half bridge because we have if the intake manifold is controlled, which I'm trying to do, you're getting a very Jekyll and Hyde motor, which I believe would create a larger power band. Um, can this be done with the full bridge? Yes. The idle does suffer, but you could still do it. And bridge ports are not unreliable. The builder is unreliable. Um, many times they'll be extremely sharp, the closing angles are wrong, the uh, actual intricacies of the bridge board as far as the aperture and the way that they are formed internally, that's a big, big difference from builder to builder. I personally know two guys who make fantastic bridge ports and they go completely different realms when it comes to their design aspect. One is CFD, uh, mechanical engineering, aerospace guy, brilliant. The other is old school plus like crazy amounts of, I guess, real world airflow testing. And his theories are not theories when they've been tested and proven and gaining power effectively time and time again. Way more than what we would expect as far as torque comes in here, carries here, and continues out. Just very impressive. But both those guys do far more than what I would say an average Bridgeport guy will do. Um, it does come down to how you're preparing the housings and very much how you assemble the motor is different as well. So anyways, when do you want to go Bridgeport? Really I would say 400 to 600 plus, right? There is no point in going with a large engine porting for your car until you are over a 400 horsepower goal. And this is to the wheels like crushing it on pump gas, right? 
when you see a very common number is 450 horsepower. This is doable on a mid to large size turbo, doable on a stock port up to a bridge port very nicely, very clean power, very wide area under the curve power band. When you go into semi and you're aiming for this power, you lose a ton of power. Um, their area under the curve for a semi peripheral port on pump gas is absolute trash and there are no benefits of it whatsoever. Um, time and time again, I'm telling you, a properly done street port or a properly done bridge is the way to go. Hands down. Um, and I would love, I would absolutely love for someone to show me how the lifespan of their apex seal is affected by a bridge port that's done correctly because I have yet to see it. We have pushed some stock port and bridge port stuff really, really far. Uh, more than I thought, and I did not publish most of this. Because um, they were street tuned. There's no need to. They just shred. And then well, that information is now brought and trickled down to other cars, which also shred. So, when do we go past full bridge? Well, that's realistically the end of the line. That should be the port that you're seeing as the cream of the crop, the best way to go. Um, again, a lot of thought has to be put into when you're doing this port and why. For lower power stuff, leave it simple, guys. Let the turbo do the work. Let the motor breathe. Let the thing idle nicely. When you're sacrificing idle and drivability for a tiny horsepower goal and you're pumping more heat into the engine because now you have an engine that flows very well. Okay, your, your bridge is going to take a lot of air in and it's going to pump a lot of air out. But if you're going for 350 horsepower, that means your turbo is now retaining that heat from the engine because you have all this airflow coming in. And if 350 horsepower for a turbo, you're probably running something like a S258 SXE, uh, EFR 7670. You know, you fart at those things and it's 350 horsepower effortless right um, so the problem is that on the turbine side the exhaust manifold side and the turbo backside everything itself if you're only aiming for 350 horsepower and your fuel system is rated for that you're holding a lot of heat to the engine which is effectively the wrong direction for what you're trying to be doing going away from a factory setup and now it makes me think of these guys that did factory twins or BNR stage three twins on REWs with bridge boards and the effective back pressure and the heat retained on the engine takes all the reliability away. It's exactly the wrong direction with where you should be aiming to do the build. And so your better choice at that power level is to leave things more towards stock. This is kind of a, a slippery slope, if you will, of, I'd just say aim for more power. Four ID1050Xs can make, what, 425 horsepower with ease. So, uh, hmm. I really think the better way of doing it is just upsize your turbo. Let the thing breathe. And if you do that, and you realize you have a small displacement motor, you might as well just run a good size port, run a good size turbo, and pull the heat out of the system. When your exhaust temperature drops, when you have things properly synced together, and they work in synergy, that's when you're going to have a setup that is fun to drive, and you're in the gear for the job. These are not V8s. These are not big, burly inline sixes. This is a very small displacement motor that drinks a ton of fuel. So downshift and enjoy. On that note, um, if anyone has specific questions as far as where they should be sizing their turbos, I still do turbo consulting for all of our size needs. I am a dealer for essentially 
Borg Warner, Garrett, Precision. I don't want to even say the others, but yes. Um, we also have custom turbo applications. I am now finally honing in as far as doing more link stuff, doing more Intron stuff. I have the Intron packages coming together very soon, which will be a true motorsport grade drop in setup. And um, I think that we'll have something that's good for every price point and budget. Um, the tough part is I'm trying to provide the cream of the crop options for the industry. And while doing so, it does price a lot of people out, right? So I don't want to be the guy who's doing here is your cheap option. That's not for me. That's never been my client base. It's never going to work. Um, if you cut corners on certain things, I can work around that. But anything that I'm producing, I will give to you to the best of my ability. This is the best we could do given this space. And it's not gonna be the cheapest. And what I can promise is we'll be the best on the market for what it's doing. It'll have full testing for every aspect of what we're doing. That's how the injectors stuff has been. That's how all the fuel system has been. That's how all the ignition coil testing and diagnostic and, and the deep dives as far as why we are running out of ignition coil power for certain things. Um, and it's really how all the turbo sizing and port stuff has been matched. So when you see how it's been gone through in a very holistic approach, you can kind of understand why I don't cut corners and it's not worth me cutting corners. So it won't be your cheap option. It'll be a good one and there are plenty other good ones on the market um, they have their own strengths and weaknesses so consult with them as well listen they might have some very good insight um, what I can tell you is I do put a lot of effort and pride into my stuff and I hope you guys can see that based on all these videos and the amount of free information that I've given out with really zero kickback so um that's how it should be uh there's so much information lost these days and the internet is such an easy place to provide and, and help others guiding them through the things and the, the don't make the same mistake that i did mentality um but the problem is that people won't believe you when you show them the results so you know that's not for everyone so Anyways, I'll catch you guys in the next one and uh, hope this un helps you understand kind of the, the selection of port work for an engine it has to do with your overall goals and it, do not overport an engine and then try to go for a low number. It's just not worth it. Too many downsides. So I'll see you guys in the next one. Cheers.